very welcoming everybody who is here on the screen. And of course, in the first session, I will welcome you, Deborah, that you are with us here. Unfortunately, not in the sense that we can see you one to one in our fantastic building in the ITA building, uh, the Institute of Technology and Architecture, the home of this institute. But you had the opportunity, uh, Deborah, last year to visit our building and uh, because you were part of the big review of the Department of Architecture, that's where we met. And I got fascinated about your work, which you are doing together and running together with your partner, Anton Garcia Abril. And this is a great opportunity to have you here. And of course, welcome to everybody who is uh, joining us. I saw the list, uh, Deborah, this afternoon, a terrific list. People from all over the world are following us. This is a kind of a novum for our institute and for this lecture format. And I'm very proud that uh, you um, are here with us and that we have so many people attending this lecture from all over the world. So welcome everybody from all, all, all over the world here in Zurich. And Today, we will have you here, Deborah, in a, in a different format. As we know, you are running your practice together with Anton, as I said, and I'm fascinated that your approach is extremely experimental, your architectural approach, and you surpass, I would say, methodological and technological and maybe also disciplinary conventions and uh, you construct landscape and you prefab houses so you are hands-on people you're one-to-one -one researchers and architects you bridge research and practice and this is maybe a subject a deeply subject and also one of the main ideas of the institute of technology in architecture we are hands-on people too we our research is one-to-one -one, and at the end there i see a lot of parallels between your work and our work you are professor at the georgia tech and before you did research as a scientist at mit you founded the pop lab prototypes of prefabrications you worked sometime between 2012 and 2018 at MIT and now you have this terrific chair in at the Design and Georgia Institute of Technology. What did you propose to us this afternoon? You propose an immersion on-site, off-site. We are very curious to see what you will propose and what you will present at the end. You use the technology, as I know from a talk which we had, the both of us, before, and you will use the technology to show what you're doing. And the good point is that the subject you are talking about, you're sitting in this, you're living this subject, and we can see the subject. This, a normal lecture in a lecture hall, can never ever reach this point. So I would say this is a terrific opportunity of being online and having this online lecture that you are in the place which is the subject of your lecture. I wondered a little bit what maybe your main, your main ideas would be. And I read in your manifesto of ensemble studio, I mean ensemble, means together, to work together, to collaborate. And this is uh, maybe one of the major subjects we have nowadays also leading in our profession, in our métier of architects and also engineers. What does your manifesto say? Maybe, Deborah, you will address it uh, later on. There are seven points. I'm very impressed. The first one is we think with our hands. 
and uh, this I think is quite uh, quite a, quite an important aspect of work. So that means you are hands-on people. You are very experimental. The second one is we go to the origin of the processes. I understand that you are researchers and that you have a scientific understanding. You dream spaces. I mean, this could lead to an improvement of life. This is what you say. And you say that your work has no pigeonholes and no barriers. So you work either on the small scale and also on the big, on the large scale, on the urban scale. You do not ignore history. I'm very happy to hear this. And you structure. Structure is the architecture. It traces the space, frames the landscape, orders, programs. At the end, it defines architectures. That's what you say, and that's what we believe. And this is, I would say, also a Vitruvian view of architecture, very ancient view of architecture. And above all, this is your last point. And with this one, I will close. You say, we do. And this will be the opening for you. I give you the stage. Uh, I pass you the stage, Deborah. And uh, happy to have you here. Welcome and welcome again to everybody who joined us in the last minute here in our ITA lecture at ETH this time online. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sasha, and uh, all of ITA and all of ETHA. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be connecting with you online and uh, very exciting to uh, hear that people are connecting from many places around the world and uh, also from their homes, probably, many of them. And you will see uh, through this lecture the role that the home plays in, uh, in the office and in uh, kind of our experimental practice. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sad that I'm not seeing all the faces. So I feel like I'm uh, uh, speaking uh, to myself a bit. But uh, I think it's also, as you mentioned, Sasha, a great uh, opportunity that I can be speaking from one of the works that I will be uh, actually talking about. Uh, so, yeah, I will I will uh, start sharing the screen and uh, and uh, sharing with you the work. Uh, I have chosen a few works that represent an important part of uh, who we are and what we do at. Uh, at Ensemble Studio. And as you men mentioned, Sasha, also we are a team. We work uh, collaboratively, and this is fundamental uh, to do the type of work that, uh, that we do in the, in the office. And uh, I, I call the lecture Offsite, Onsite, because I'm going to be talking about two very different, um, we could say, methodologies or ways of building architecture that we have been practicing throughout the years and have uh, become uh, kind of a very interesting fields for experimentation. And I will uh, show you what uh, we do on these two sides um, uh, through our work. It is very important to, to mention that, um, and you will see in this practice, it's very focused on the means and methods on the technologies that are able to build our ideas and support the theories that we as architects develop about architecture. And uh, in our case, we most uh, part of the team was trained as architects in Spain, but throughout the years we have uh, learned to wear other hats that are very important to do the things that we do. Uh, we've certainly become builders, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to realize some of the works that I'll be uh, sharing with you. We sometimes operate as developers, we collaborate intensely and therefore have acquired a lot of knowledge about uh, engineering. So we are a very uh, interdisciplinary team and this is um, uh, of course key for uh, architecture and also when uh, as an architect, you're trying to escape 
uh, or move away from more conventional uh, ways of, of doing things. And uh, I will put as an example this early work uh, where we were trying to build with, uh, with the stone, with uh, granite in, in the north of Spain, in Galicia. And we decided that instead of using um, the products that were offered by suppliers uh, from a catalog, we decided to use a spare material from a quarry um, to build the building. And this sounded like a great idea because uh, we were using leftover material. And uh, the, let's say the design part was, uh, was pretty easy. We in Ensemble Studio always say that it is very easy to have good ideas. Uh, we are all very capable of coming up with fantastic uh, propositions. For us, the key uh, or the most difficult part, critical part of being an architect is the transition from this moment of uh, having an idea to actually executing it. This moment of execution or this process of execution um, it can be uh, tricky, it can be very hard, it's sometimes a miracle. And uh, it is therefore fundamental for the architect to uh, understand about how these ideas can be implemented. And uh, again, when you're trying to change some of the rules of the game, even if things make total sense, like recycling waste material, it involves a lot of uh, engagement, a lot of perseverance, a lot of time that we were able to spend, especially early in our, uh, in our early years as practicing architects, um, because uh, you really have to be there to make things happen if, uh, if, uh, if you're proposing certain changes to how things are typically done. So these early years when we were building this work in, in Santiago de Compostela, uh, really taught us a lot of things and started to shape the way in which we understand architecture and uh, the world of the architect. Uh, in this case, for example, it's the first work in which we had to become the contractors of the work, so to assume the liability, to assume the risks in order to make it happen. And, um, and in order to, to be able to accomplish this in uh, the city of, of Santiago de Compostela. But this first work um, was, uh, was really fundamental and, uh, and uh, started to inform the way in which we've been looking and developing uh, other ideas and other projects where we see the architect as, uh, as um, a key agent in the definition of uh, not just the, the, the future, shaping the future of the cities and the places where we live, but also building, um, building the present. Uh, and uh, in a way, in our practice, we don't take for granted given models. Uh, as I think Sasha was mentioning, we do uh, learn about history and we try to continue history. Uh, we feel part of it, but we don't uh, take given models or methods or brief as uh, fixed uh, barriers. We try to uh, understand the bigger picture and transcend it if necessary. Uh, we usually craft our own processes and, uh, and we think that the role of the architect can be reshaped with every mission and needs to be reshaped in order to give uh, the best of, of who we are. And in our case, it sometimes involves assuming a certain risks in order to uh, be able to, to, to realize some of the, of the visions and the projects that uh, we have in mind, as I will be showing uh, to you. There is a continuous uh, exploration about ideas. So there is a research process that is happening where works are part of that process. They're not dead ends. And uh, I think it is clear in our work how uh, one project is informing the next and it's continuing that research that uh, is uh, it's never ending. It goes from one place to another as we learn and as we train ourselves and as we uh, test certain ideas, but also discover others as we are building uh, the projects. 
And this is for us very exciting. The fact that when we build something, it's not, it is uh, finished in its physical form, but uh, intellectually it's still absolutely rich and relevant and, um, and influencing uh, the work. And this happens from the earliest project to uh, the last one. Uh, for us, the house is our laboratory. We have, uh, I mean, this was not intentional, but we have a kind of realized this as we look back at the work, but it is the, um, the perfect scale where we can test uh, a lot of the ideas assuming, as I was mentioning before, some of the risks that would be hard to assume in larger works. So we've developed a number of uh, houses. You have uh, some on the screen that I'm presenting that uh, have started very interesting um, moments for the, uh, for the studio and that we continue to uh, work on the ideas that these works uh, started. And, uh, and uh, these houses uh, then influence larger scale projects or projects that we develop for other clients. Important is to say that the three houses that uh, you can see at the top, Meroscopian House, Cyclopean House, where I am uh, sitting right now, and, uh, and the Truffle, we operated here as, uh, as architects, as uh, contractors, and as developers as well, to be able to have the freedom to accomplish and, and do these works uh, with uh, uh, you know, the way in which we had uh, designed them. <clears throat> so the, let's say the two uh, different methodologies that I'm going to present to you today have to do with these uh, um, off-site and on-site uh, projects two approaches to design and to construction. Uh, the, the top image being the Meroscopian house uh, using off-site technologies, standard elements that uh, are arranged in a non-standard way to produce a non-standard space, but that uh, in a way use all the benefits of prefabrication in terms of construction time and quality and uh, cost management. And then on the bottom image, you can see uh, the work that we did at Tippett Price Art Center. Uh, this one in particular is called Domo. <clears throat> and uh, it is a fully on-site work that is totally site-specific and dependent on the context, uh, where almost the landscape is uh, shaped to uh, make this work and the work becomes part uh, of the landscape. So the Emeroscopian house that we uh, built almost uh, 12 years ago is still absolutely relevant to the work that we do. This house, uh, we wanted to appropriate an existing technology of precast concrete. And um, we wanted to see how these elements that you can get from uh, the, the precaster uh, catalog, their standard elements. And you typically in Spain, we were typically seeing it uh, used to building highways and bridges and water channels. Uh, we wanted to use these large scale elements and uh, transport them uh, or translate them into a domestic space uh, to see what the effect uh, would be. And so in this exercise, it was very important, of course, to understand uh, this is uh, an element, an architectural element that already came with its own logic. So part of the project was really understanding what the opportunities and the limitations uh, were in terms of uh, its, uh, its uh, material properties, its structural uh, properties. Uh, due to the given form, also the logistics involved in uh, fabricating and transporting and assembling these elements. And with all of this in mind, uh, we created this um, uh, idea of a house, a courtyard house that is uh, open into, opens into the landscape in different ways. 
and uh, produces a very asymmetric uh, structure and therefore asymmetric space by the assembly and progressive rotation of uh, these uh, standard elements. And I hold each beam that are um, assembled in, in this very coordinated uh, sequence. And we were doing this uh, in this house for the first time. And what you can see is uh, also something that Sasha was mention mentioning in the beginning when he was reading the manifesto of the studio, that structure is the architecture. I think it is very clear in this house where uh, the image of the work under construction on the left is almost the same as the complete work on the right. We're using these huge heavy parts uh, to build a structure, but at the same time they are the structure, they become um, the, you know, the walls, the roofs, uh, the facades, the partitions, uh, they are the finished, the finishes of uh, these architectures, and they um, certainly frame the spaces of the house, frame the views, and uh, create the, the environment in, in which we uh, will live. And this is very important because this house is uh, our house in Madrid. It is where we, um, where we live when we are there. And so we, uh, with this house, for the first time, we became our own guinea pigs where after designing and building, we then inhabit the house and we keep receiving important uh, feedback about uh, how these heavy uh, parts, for instance, uh, suddenly can propose very transparent, very light spaces because of the way in which they are positioned in the space. And also, like I was uh, uh, bringing about in the beginning how these standard parts that we associate with other applications take a new meaning here and therefore uh, a new potential is uh, discovered. And the lessons that we learn here we then uh, use when we think about other projects and uh, this is uh, uh, um, the Reader's House that we did, a media tech in Madrid. This was a project for a client, a competition that uh, we won where we were transforming a media tech into uh, a, a slaughterhouse into a media tech. And we were using this precast concrete technology and what we had learned about how these heavy elements can actually build uh, light spaces. Uh, we were using all this knowledge to transform this space, right? The same way that we also use those lessons that we learned using and working with these um, large scale elements, how to apply them to also uh, bigger scale uh, architectures uh, using the knowledge of uh, and the opportunities of the offsite. But at the same time, because we were hands on building these things, um, and we were very aware of the huge cranes we had to use uh, to um, rig these elements and put them into position. And also, you know, all the logistics involved in the process, we were also very interested in uh, exploring how could we continue to use the benefits of off-site technologies, uh, of fabricating things off-site, but reducing one of its biggest limitations, which is the, the weight of materials. So um, in other words, the research that you have now on the screen is um, a reaction to this experience of building with precast concrete, exploring how we could change the concrete for uh, the lighter material that we could think of that was foam, which is 98% uh, air. And so you can see how we are, uh, in this case, we are in uh, MIT laboratory exploring, learning from uh, the Meroscopion house and from precast concrete technology. And, uh, and you can probably recognize the form of one of those uh, concrete beams that I was showing. And here we are substituting the concrete uh, with foam and kind of testing this very extreme um, a structure where we have almost erased the weight of it 
and we uh, build this uh, 15, feet, 15 uh, meter, 40 feet long beam. We can move it with a small trolley so you can really see how light it is. And we lift it with a car jack, something that you wouldn't be able to do for sure with a 20 ton concrete beam. And then we had it uh, standing on the lab for a long time uh, to, to test its performance. And uh, for us, all these experiments um, are very important, are fundamental, but there's always the need to apply ideas in, uh, in real life. And when I say real life, it's not that the lab is not real life, but when you are operating in a, in a context of a laboratory, you're not sometimes, uh, you don't have to comply necessarily with all the codes and all the constraints that um, architecture has. And so the next uh, step for us was um, to do a work where we could advance the research, introducing all of these constraints about fire codes, about zoning regulations, and, um, and then uh, advance the research in this manner. And so having moved at that time from Spain to uh, the US, uh, where we were in, uh, working in, in MIT, we decided to build our second home and again uh, become the guinea pigs. And this is the home where I am uh, right now that we call Cyclopean House. We um, looked for the cheapest property in, uh, in Brookline, which is a, a nice neighborhood with good public schools for our kids. And uh, we found the ugly duckling of the neighborhood, which is uh, this garage you're gonna see to the right. And you can see how the neighbor houses are all about uh, three stories high, but this is a one story concrete block uh, building. And to us, it had a lot of potential because it had this kind of incomplete uh, look to it. And so we decided to uh, purchase this uh, garage, move into it for two years, and while we were living there, uh, plan the extension of the house. And the project was very simple. It was basically um, to build on top of this garage one space, uh, one big room full of light, full of air, uh, that would be a kind of multi-purpose domestic space. Here we wanted to test both uh, the technology but also the typology of a leaf work space that would uh, uh, combine all the functions in, in one big room. And then uh, a roof garden was the other ingredient of this uh, house. And uh, learning from a Metroscopian house that I showed before, uh, understanding the benefits of organizing the prefabrication of the house in big parts that can reduce the maneuvers and the time of construction, uh, we used that, uh, that knowledge to produce the house. We knew at that time that we were going to fabricate it in Spain with our team and ship it uh, to the US because building with a US contractor at a US price was completely impossible and unaffordable to us. And also by building it ourselves in, in, a, in a shop in Madrid, we were able to uh, um, continue to advance uh, the research while we were building the house. And the sequence again, was to um, to design and to engineer and to fabricate these big parts. In this case, it's not uh, these parts are embedding also all the mechanical systems uh, and all the insulation uh, that in a city like Boston, where I am now, it's fundamental. And they were dimensioned also to fit into a shipping container. The house is uh, a plot of uh, 30 by 38 feet. The length of a container is 40 feet. So it was great that uh, the length of the house could, or that the pieces could be dimensioned to the full length of the house. 
And then we planned, um, of course, before uh, fabricating, we had planned this journey of how the pieces would arrive from uh, our shop in, uh, in Madrid uh, to, to Boston. And so in Madrid, we keep advancing the research, uh, this research on ultralight materials. We keep using very lightweight materials like uh, galvanized steel studs, but we are reinforcing um, the, the, the foam uh, course that had uh, been part of our previous research. And uh, we are, of course, engineering these elements to um, be performative structurally in their last um, position, but also during the trip where they are going to be exposed to different types of stresses. Kate, we can do it with our hands and we don't depend on a fabricate other fabricators and then the house arrives in the container um, the process is very well coordinated and the house is assembled in uh, uh, seven days which you know was great for the neighbors who already lived there because they didn't have to stay seven especially in these days that we are living today where we work where we uh, sleep where we um, um, socialize and where we um, uh, play. And uh, once more, we are here, the, the guinea pigs, and uh, learning uh, with this house uh, a lot about these construction efficiencies and the benefit of, um, of uh, prefabrication. And then uh, the benefits of uh, and also the uh, conflicts of space efficiency, of what it is to, instead of fully comp compartment uh, a space to, uh, and have a, a bunch of smaller rooms, you know, what if we have just one big room where everything uh, happens? And of course, negotiations need also uh, to, ha to happen on the use of this space. But, um, the way in which we were thinking about this is that we prefer to have, instead of a small bedroom and a small living room and a small kitchen, we prefer to have a monumental um, space that would fit them all. So this house sparks uh, a lot of new ideas uh, after having a result for us uh, a very interesting house at a very, very low cost that would be impossible to build uh, normally in the US, in the type of neighborhoods that we live in. We uh, got excited and, and got the ambition to try to uh, bring these ideas to a larger scale where we could provide more affordable housing without sacrificing the quality of the space or the quality of the construction. And so uh, where we are now with this research is actually trying to see how we can scale up and how we can um, uh, develop different typologies that, um, that use this knowledge. And we uh, created a startup uh, called World Homes that we are fully uh, developing right now where we take this idea of building elements that contain everything the structure the mechanical systems the finishes are highly designed and engineered and optimized and so we develop a discrete number of parts creating kind of a catalog and then these parts um, can enable multiple uh, configurations and and play right so once more using standard parts to build non-standard uh, buildings so with these models and you can see if you see my back I have a bunch of them in, on those shelves behind me uh, we are kind of testing the system and seeing how these parts could be applied to build larger scale residential uh, complexes that uh, in the case of, of the US, for instance, are able to um, you know, use or serve as a response to some of the 
uh, challenges of housing today. And also uh, typologically, um, combining some of the tech lightweight technologies with concrete to produce uh, high rise structures as well as uh, uh, low rise ones. And uh, throughout the years, our office has evolved from being a medium sized office space, a small model room to this video I'm showing now. It's the construction of our recently completed uh, office in Madrid, which is now a, a very, very small, tiny office and a huge fabrication space where we don't need to be renting like we did for the Cyclopean house. Uh, a warehouse to build the things that we built, but uh, where we can have a big space that uh, serves to uh, as, as our laboratory. And also with this work, we are taking the opportunity to move one step ahead of the Cyclopean house and uh, explore this prefabricated system that is going to combine uh, the benefits of the very lightweight parts with uh, concrete to kind of uh, consolidate um, and be able to build larger span structures and also um, higher rise structures. And it is uh, in this uh, factory that we are now in the face of uh, prototyping some of these uh, prefabricated parts that I was uh, showing also with the uh, idea of gradually start to introduce, you know, move from the hands-on uh, or building with our hands mode to introducing uh, automation, which would be the next step towards um, uh, efficiency and evolving the fabrication of these parts. And so this is a research that has to do with, uh, um, you know, building in contexts like cities that demand a lot of uh, these uh, efficiencies but where efficiency normally means a lack of uh, of quality or a reduction of other values that architecture should have and now i'm going to move uh, to um, a vision of the on-site uh, technologies and methodologies that we've been developing that have to do with totally different contexts where it's not really about optimizing as much as possible the construction so that you can dedicate most of the money and the effort into the quality of the architecture but it's really about understanding a certain unique contexts and landscapes and uh, building with them a very site-specific works. Um, so, in this case, I will start showing uh, a project that uh, started this idea of work with the landscape and it's called uh, the truffle. It is, uh, this uh, project is a poem in the landscape. Uh, the aim or the ambition of the project was really how to uh, build a space in a very remote and uh, underdeveloped a uh, landscape that would belong to that uh, landscape as it was finished. And so we developed the truffle project that is, um, it's almost like a recipe. There are no conventional architectural drawings for this uh, project, but it's mostly um, a method that we, um, that we um, craft. And that I will explain step by step. First, the idea is to, um, make a hole on the ground and then uh, this creates let's say a formwork without almost any effort using the local uh, material and ground then we take the hay bales from the neighbor also a very local material and we shape we form the space with it and then we fill the space uh, in between with concrete and this creates um, the structure of, of the space. So we have been able to build this structure without uh, scaffolding or complicated and expensive uh, methods. And then we, once the concrete has cured, we remove the earth from around it. 
we make cuts wherever we have a, a plant to uh, have a window or a door and we get uh, the neighbor's cow to eat the hay bale that is inside the truffle and, uh, and discover the space. So this is a project that tries to use as much as possible all the local resources, all the local materials, and to produce a space that at the time we had no idea what would it be. But here are some images that show step-by-step step this process I was uh, talking about where the workers one more is uh, our team and uh, the helpers are some of the neighbors uh, as well. And so there is a magical moment, also a very scary moment, where we are removing the hay bales. We have no idea what is going to happen. This is the first time we're ever doing this, but luckily we are um, our own client. So if this had been a disaster, nobody would be seeing these images. And, uh, and it was a manageable uh, risk to us. Right? But then we discover these you no, know, still very dirty, but very beautiful textures that we had. Uh, we had the intuition we could get, but we had no idea that this would be the exact uh, effect, right? And we get these textures where, um, you know, the, the chemistry between the hay bale and the concrete, the earth and the concrete has happened and has produced these super interesting textures that almost without intending it blend uh, the landscape and the, the land with the architecture. And this uh, idea of without effort is very important to us because if you see the level of detail of articulation of texture that the concrete has and in our opinion the beauty that it has, we are completely sure this wouldn't be as beautiful if we had planned every wrinkle and every corner. And, uh, uh, and so there is some level of spontaneity that we are absolutely fascinated uh, with. And so this, uh, this um, project that happens almost at the same time, a bit later than the Emeroscopian House, we completed this project 10 years ago in 2010, is critical to understand a later project that we did uh, in Montana, uh, Tippet Rice Art Center, where in this vast uh, landscape, beautiful, amazing um, landscape, also very raw, and uninhabited, uh, we were asked by our clients, uh, the Tippet Rice uh, Foundation, to think about an art center that would be able to bring art and visitors into the land without creating an obstacle to its beauty or to its uh, raw condition. Um, Yellowstone, which is uh, uh, Yellowstone Park that is located very close to the ranch where we developed the art center is one of the geologically more active um, uh, places on earth and uh, the geology there is absolutely present and relevant for this project because this project is really about learning uh, or forgetting all we know or a lot that we know about architecture and the rules of architecture and um, and developing an architecture that, like the truffle, is able to speak much more and follow much more some of the guidelines and ideas of the site. Uh, the program for the architecture that we had to build was to complement some of the um, artworks from very interesting artists like Calder, uh, Stephen Talasnik, uh, Mark Di Suvero, uh, these art pieces are located, spread out uh, in the landscape, each occupying their own intimate uh, moment. And the architectures that we wanted to create were uh, instead of one big 
museum building, we wanted to explode the museum program into a series of outdoor rooms that would scatter across this landscape and, uh, and propose these, uh, these rooms in, in contact with uh, the land and with the artworks. And so this is the master plan uh, project that we submitted. And for the architectures, we wanted to get inspiration from the land itself, from some of its geological uh, processes of, uh, of explosion and sedimentation, of erosion and, uh, and uh, fragmentation. And we wanted to really um, use this uh, landscape that we were working on as our a reference on our guide. And so the project is about inventing almost like a new architectural language that learns from, um, from geology and from these uh, plays. And along it also construction processes that are in architectures uh, would integrate in different moments of the landscape. Uh, sometimes serving specific purposes like connecting disconnected parts or offering new views um, or activating certain um, energies or offering uh, to visitors water or just shade. This is a very um, deserted place with almost no shade uh, and very extreme weather in both winter and summer. So actually understanding the architecture as a shelter or as a place uh, within an otherwise um, very vast uh, land it was uh, the way in which we interpreted uh, the, the program. And then these uh, open architectures, open rooms would be able to host as needed the artistic musical programs that were part of, um, of this art center uh, without at, at any time feeling like um, empty buildings. And so you can see here uh, now three of the works that we built. This is one of them, Birtooth Portal. Uh, the process of, of uh, uh, design this project is going from the model, 3D scanning the model, uh, and then doing all the engineering but the model is the way in which we are thinking about the work using matter and then uh, the key uh, project uh, element and so it was very important for these works of course to be structurally stable and um, and also very important to design uh, the process in which they were going to be uh, built and put together. And what you're seeing are those, is this effort of uh, understanding how this irregular shape is going to operate and be reinforced and be uh, lifted. And uh, because the idea is that similarly to the truffle, the earth is going to serve as a uh, the let's say the support like the bed um, of this uh, of this architecture and um, and so this is to support the concept that the architecture is born from the land but it is also of course uh, a very important for the economics of the project it is much uh, cheaper much easier to cast these uh, big rocks flat and then tilt them than to create very complex uh, scaffolding. So the idea for this uh, specific um, architecture is that it's going to be um, casted on the ground and we are going to uh, dig the holes like we did in the truffle. Uh, the reinforcement is going to be built based on the form that has been created and then uh, it's going to be casted, it's going to cure in a flat position and then uh, we will lift it when it's ready and it has acquired all its uh, structural strength. Like you can see um, in this moment now. And so there are things that we do control uh, which are these structural parameters, uh, of course very important ideas about 
a weight and gravity uh, center in order to lift these masses, but there are other aspects of the work that do not require so much precision. And this is very important for the construction process if we understand that this is done in a very remote place with the labor that is not necessarily um, used to doing this kind of work. So there's a lot of flexibility embedded in the whole uh, process. But when the work is built, um, it can be uh, uninhabited or it can be activated and actually serve as a, as a shelter, as a place uh, to be and to experience the, the land. There is a second work that we did, Inverted Portal, that uh, follows a very similar process. It's just casted and uh, um, the moment of lifting inverts uh, the process that we just saw before. But you can see uh, by the dimension of the cranes, you can understand the weight that these uh, structures have. And this was important uh, because this is a very extreme weather, high winds. And so the heaviness in this case of the parts of the architecture uh, being them the only uh, elements that compose it was uh, fundamental for its uh, stability. And then one of the, let's say, goals that we uh, were able to achieve was this idea that the architecture wouldn't feel like an empty building at any time and that would coexist with the ranching activity existing on the on the site and would be compatible also with preserving the wildlife and uh, the kind of spirit of the place. The work I will talk about also in this center is Domo. This is a larger uh, structure that uh, we are not going to lift or move because it is a very heavy uh, structure. And so we just manipulate the ground to be able to cast it on place. And then we remove uh, the ground to discover it like we did in the truffle, only that at a much larger scale. This piece is 30 meters uh, long. And so in this case, on top of uh, the smaller scale models, it was very important to uh, do larger scale models where we would um, not just uh, control and test and uh, design um, some of the textures and some of the methods, but also we would test the acoustics of the space. This architecture is meant to hold uh, concerts and uh, as well as being a, a shelter um, where different uh, activities and events can take place. But you can see through this image um, the scale of the work and how difficult it was to actually control the scale of the architecture in this very vast landscape with almost no uh, reference that we architects are used to when we're working in more urban or built environments. And uh, you can see the process here of, um, of the uh, excavations um, that fit the form, the uh, plastics that are going to shape and um, uh, build the textures and also uh, shape the acoustics based on the level of reflectivity uh, or uh, porosity of uh, the material. And then some of the reinforcement that was done in a very uh, low tech uh, way, but uh, that you can see being fitted here on the structure. And then the moment where um, the concrete is poured to uh, uh, consolidate and form uh, the structure, we let it harden and then we. Uh, once more discover the architecture. And I say discover because for this work also, it is very difficult to anticipate what the uh, outcome is going to really be. And this is sometimes very hard to understand for a client because what a client usually asks you nowadays, 
the first day is almost for the render, the image of the project. Uh, but we were very lucky to work in this project with uh, Kathy, Kathy and Peter Halstead. They are both artists and they understand what um, you know, experimentation means, what uh, this whole process was about. And they were able to embrace this uh, uncertainty with the same excitement. Because the moment when we uh, unearth the work, it is like unwrapping a present, right? You, uh, in this case, of course, we know what the package contains, but we are for the first time now seeing, uh, you know, the uh, precise uh, outcome of every wrinkle, every stain, um, every, uh, even the last forming of the, of the work and also how it operates with the scale of the of the landscape and you can see here some of these uh, beautiful textures that uh, you uh, were seeing you know these uh, concrete beams of emeroscopium it is uh, interesting to see a material the same material uh, taking very different forms based on what it is casted against And so these, uh, these architectures uh, are able to stand the, the extreme seasons. They're able to provide shelter without um, feeling invasive to the site. They're able to host uh, events. And uh, they have an, an ambiguous this is a, a short video I hope you can hear of a concert being played in Domo. So for us, this uh, type of work also shows us how as an ar as architect, sometimes uh, you need to do uh, less than uh, more and also shows us different ways of, uh, of inhabit. And uh, as the other works I showed previously, it's a work that we keep learning from uh, every day and, uh, and certainly shows our attitude about being an architect as somebody who is not just responding automatically to the briefs that are given, but is also able to offer uh, visions and uh, and projects, uh, of course, always at the risk of, of uh, not being uh, always right. But none of these projects are solutions in themselves. They are just investigations and our, our own way of responding to questions that uh, for us are very relevant. Uh, I thank you very much for your patience. Um, if you were able to hold uh, for this long period of time, I welcome any questions that uh, might have uh, arised if you've written them in the chat. And, um, and thank you, yes. Thank you, thank you a lot, Deborah, for this uh, wonderful lecture.
and uh, uh, we had this immersion into into the off-site, into the on-site, into your work, and we could experience it even in in the the houses you are you're living in. And there are some questions. The idea of the following would be that you walk with your camera through the house and uh, maybe you can answer questions walking through the house. <laughs> I don't know how you want to handle it, but this would be kind of an opportunity, a new chance yes. to be quite, quite active talking and showing. And I think this lecture is even quite experimental. We got a bunch of we got a bunch of questions. I don't know. I think you see them too, Deborah. But if you like, I can start and, and reading it. So one question refers to the Cyclopean house. How do the neighbors like it? And also how performant is insulation? It's kind of a technical question since there seems to be a lot of heat bridges. And uh, in the following, uh, uh, Patrick wants to know how does Ensemble think about reconfiguration of those large and light elements during occupancy, which you're showing here. Can you say something about this, Deborah? Yes. So now I feel like I'm holding, as I'm holding the computer, I'm holding all of you guys <laughs> <laughs> at the same time. So the first one um, about the insulation. So these, as I showed, um, well, maybe I didn't show so many images about how these were built, but uh, these parts have a um, foam core. So they're fully insulated and then they are reinforced with uh, galvanized steel studs that are resistant enough to hold, you know, a two story um, um, house that this is and so uh, and then the windows in this case we're using acrylics we're using thick acrylics and uh, I will say that the, the windows are not the most uh, or highest performative and this was just not a question of design but mostly uh, if we had had the money we had we would have a uh, triple glazing uh, windows and maybe in the future uh, this will be the upgrade that we can do, but um, we we had to manage where we were uh, putting the money, and so we decided to use um, acrylic that performs pretty well um, for the weather, uh, not as well as a triple glazing would do, uh, and that also for the transportation. Uh, it was also kind of safer for us to to use as it would hold uh, all of these um, let's say transportation and craning movements uh, much easier and without other surprises so in a, in a way in this case we decided to risk just those uh, things that were more important for the project and then play it safe in, in others, but the house performs uh, pretty well. We have uh, radiant heating on the floor and we don't need uh, other support. When it gets super, super cold in the winter, there are maybe a couple of days where uh, it feels that we could uh, use uh, some other support system, but it is, um, it is two days um, in the winter. And then the second question was about the, can you second refresh? The second question was about the reconfiguration of those large light elements during mm -hmm. occupancy. Yeah, so the way in which we uh, designed this house was that uh, the structural elements and the perimeter elements uh, are, let's say, containing all the functions. Um, this one that you see on the back is mostly storage, not just because of the shelves, because that's an, an addition that came later, but um, I can show you. But many of these, um, let's see if we can do this. Many of these uh, drawers open and they contain things inside. Uh, and this happens all along this uh, bench. They are all kind of storage elements. The electricity is uh, 
is included in these uh, vertical stats. Maybe the more complicated or complex element is this one here that contains the kitchen and, uh, and the bathroom. And we decided, uh, you know, for efficiency and also, um, also um, for easiness during the construction to, uh, let's say, put the kitchen and the bathroom all compact together in the same um, uh, element. And that connects also with the kitchen that is uh, in the lower level. So these, and then, okay, maybe I can show you this one I have to locate, but this is becoming very homey, almost uh, invading my intimacy. But this is the, um, so we have some storage here, and then maybe the secret place is the Murphy bed, which at night when we're done working, and uh, playing, watching movies, whatever we're doing, we just pull out the bed and we have a, a Murphy bed, which is one of the greatest uh, inventions. <laughs> uh, <there's a> lot <laughs> of questions, that's really great. This hidden bed, I remember when I had the opportunity to have lunch with you and Anton and friends in this room, but the bed, of course, wasn't there at that moment. Yeah. There is a question about affordability. Is this mm -hmm. uh, concept, this idea you have, makes it uh, housing more affordable, do you think? Is there, uh, the prices are lower to build with your concept? Well, we are pretty confident uh, that this is the case. It's easier to test when you, again, when you operate as the contractor and the fabricator and, um, uh, and the developer because you are the architect because you are eliminating a lot of inefficiencies. So this is what we're trying to do with uh, the startup that we created with Woho is to really uh, reduce all the inefficiencies, all those intermediate steps throughout the construction process that do not add value. The fact is that um, the cost of materials is the cost of materials. And, uh, and that usually represents a very, if you're operate and, and working with good quality materials, but normal materials, that usually represents a, uh, a small percentage of the final cost of, uh, of a house. And uh, if we talk about uh, the US where I am now, it is labor cost that really offsets uh, the price and makes it uh, unaffordable for uh, many, many people. So uh, by introducing uh, some efficiencies during the construction, controlling the construction, being able to do it uh, in a factory place uh, where you don't need to stop because of the crazy weather of uh, the winters in Boston or where you are able to organize the work um, uh, better and uh, you know where you are controlling more the flow of materials and so on, we are completely confident that this can, uh, that this can happen. Whether that is a vision that will happen in two years or in 10 years, that's what we are fighting right now because the fact is that it is, um, it is difficult to operate at a larger scale where there are a lot of players that are doing things differently and, um, and that are part of this kind of big mess that in our opinion, um, uh, is involved in the construction of uh, many of the housing developments. But we are, I mean, we are cer certainly sure from a technical point of view, we have proven it, we've done it, we've paid for it, so we know exactly what the cost uh, is. Uh, but when you do larger scale projects, there are uh, other stakeholders that also have a say, and that's what we are now uh, really diving in and, and working on. Good news is that there's huge need for housing and for housing that it's more um, economical for for people and uh, so i think there's an opportunity now to propose these ideas and uh, carry them through any problems with building codes is another question deborah 
So we had no problems with, uh, with the building codes here for this specific house. Uh, I mean, building codes, one thing is the building code that we all work with. Another thing is the local inspection, mm -hmm. that it's very local and you have to uh, work on a case-to-case -case, uh, basis. For this house, we just went to um, the, the building department, we talked to the people, we un try, tried to understand uh, what was important for them, and we worked with them. When you do that on a larger scale, there are certification companies that can uh, certify some of these uh, prefab parts in the factory. There are certain processes that are in place already to make um, uh, off-site technologies uh, possible. But in the end, it's a negotiation also. It's a conversation with uh, local authorities to see uh, how comfortable they feel and how the, pro the process needs to be adjusted so that they can uh, play a role that they want to play in, in that. But from a code compliance point of view. Um, everything that we do is um, properly engineered, okay. stamped, and uh, yeah. Let's move from off-site to on-site. So many questions, I cannot do them all, <laughs> but I will, I will try. One a very interesting uh, question is, can you elaborate how fabrication tolerances and structural feedback scanned geometry versus or original geometries was used to inform the on-site construction processes for Cyclopean and Truffle House? The sense, what fabrication challenges were experienced in your practice? What fabrication experience? So, um... I mean, fabrication experience, we have uh, learned doing. We, um, we were happy to, I mean, we were lucky to graduate uh, some years ago in Spain to receive a polytechnic education as architects. And then as we finished, we had uh, opportunities to win, I mean, to, to compete. So there were competitions available for young architects and we were able to win some of those and build. And by building, that's how we uh, learned. And, and also by, um, as I showed, in parallel to commissioned work or to competitions that we were doing, uh, we were uh, anything, any um, uh, revenue that entered the office, we were spending it in building these small works like the truffle uh, uh, that uh, allowed us to also develop the, the kind of topics that we are interested in and that then have been able to inform other work, works that we do. So for us, um, you know, this has been a learning process. The images I showed um, um, in the first, uh, the first images I showed in the quarry, when I was doing that project, um, Anton and Javier, they were already a bit more experienced, but I was just a recent graduate. That was my first contact uh, with the construction site. And uh, I just spent there uh, four months in the quarry uh, trying to learn and to um, defend our ideas and our projects and, and work them out, right? So it was really, I think everything can be learned in life. Um, uh, it's, it's true that now with uh, a lot of uh, online tutorials and online information, it's even much easier to learn about anything. It's just a question of dedication and, and time. And in terms of tolerances, um, you know, there is, maybe a, a huge difference that I didn't uh, address, but I hope it's, it's clear in this uh, difference of, of approach between the offsite and the onsite. When you're uh, doing work offsite uh, and you are uh, prefabricating parts that ne then need to come together into a specific site, precision is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And this is the difficult part, that there's a lot more time that needs to go into the engineering, into the design, so that everything is perfectly tuned, uh, decided, uh, organized, and then on the site, um, things run smoothly. 
and the um, and so this is the implications of of doing things in this manner in the on-site uh, work there's a lot more of flexibility of course you need to control the important aspects of performance of a structure and a building but then in terms for those specific projects in terms of uh, the final form itself in terms of when we are excavating whether we excavate one inch more or less whether you know the boundary uh, the wind blows the, the soil of the boundary and the shape shifts a bit you know there's really that's not important that's not where the value of that work is and so we are able to be more flexible with certain formal aspects um, and and so it's a different type of of, uh, of precision in this uh, um, respect is not so a uh, key to the success of the work and actually in the in the context of montana for example that we were not familiar with uh, the let's say the the skill of and the type of labor available there we had to do a lot of adaptations uh, of how things were putting uh, being put in place Maybe to come to a conclusion, uh, dear Deborah, after this fascinating pictures and movies and what you told us about it, it's, I feel, and maybe this wraps up a little bit some of the questions being posed, is it's a, it's a kind of a balance, especially your, your on-site work between the unknown, intuition, in a belief, in creation, and on the other side between, let's say, calculation and, uh, let's say, the, the research we are used to do, the classical research. I think you are bridging and balancing these two. Is, is, could one say this? Is this? Does this affect this balance, your work? Or is it, is hey. it more on the intuition or is it more on calculation? I think, yeah, it's probably the balance. I don't have an answer for that because the fact is that it would be easier to say, you know, we started doing prefabrication or offsite technologies, we got bored and then we shifted into something else. But the fact is that uh, we, a metroscopian house and the truffle that mark kind of these two approaches uh, happen almost at the same time. And from then on, we've been doing uh, projects of, uh, of these two or that continue these two investigations in parallel almost and so we were doing this house the cyclopean house was being done at the same time we were doing the project in montana eh, of the tippet rice art center so eh, magically these two things eh, are happening in parallel without it being an intention eh, there are projects that uh, I, I haven't shown but that uh, bring values of of both so it's not either or it's just uh, these things uh, make sense for the context in which they are thought and uh, and built when we are able to to build and so they are we don't see although they they're pretty distinct we don't see them as a completely independent uh, path it's certainly the same people doing them so they should have things in common. <laughs> so, Deborah, I would like to come to an end and sorry for those if not every question has been answered, but I think the, the answers of uh, Deborah were quite broad and, and, and very, very clear about what they are doing, what Ensemble is doing. Thank you, thank you so much, Deborah for this very Thank inspiring, you. I see it also from the chats which are coming in, very inspiring, interesting lecture. Uh, you've got lots of fans and uh, I think we have to look, we, have a, we need a closer look in the future to what Ensemble, what uh, you and what Anton are doing. In this sense, I would like to thank the community, I would like to thank ITA, the Institute of Technology and Architecture at ETH, based in the Department of Architecture. It was a great evening, an inspiring evening, and I wish everybody uh, now a great after show and a great after lecture.
here in Europe, we will have dinner. You, Debra, you will have, I think, lunch, right? So yes, about that. I so, think so. Thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, the, there is the last question I can answer. The, the uh, lecture has been recorded and it will be available on the, ETA, on the ETA homepage. So thank you for your attention. And I say goodbye, good evening and good afternoon to you. And good morning to the people in the, in the further west and the ones in the east, they have night at the moment. We are used to this because we are chatting all over the world in all time zones. Thank you, Deborah, again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all. Cheers. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.